So errors in variables is uh, another commonly cited source of the endogeneity problem. And for the sake of uh, clarity, I will discuss uh, two types of cases. One where the errors are placed in the dependent variable y, and another case where errors occur in the, in the explanatory variable x. But first, uh, let's uh, consider a couple of examples of uh, uh, why there might be measurement errors in our data to get some uh, practical feeling first. So um, obviously, if you use some survey response data, then um, this kind of survey data are often uh, based on some subjective judgment. So as a more practical example, recall from this uh, housing market uh, data of ESPO, even in that case, there was uh, this condition of apartment, uh, which is measured by three categories, weak, satisfactory or good. So clearly this kind of uh, condition of apartment is based on uh, subjective judgment by it's probably the seller or the, or the realtor who has made this kind of judgment, but uh, there must be some uh, borderline cases where it's not uh, entirely uh, clear that is the apartment in good condition or perhaps just satisfactory. And it might be that the buyer is of a little bit different opinion than the seller about it, for example. So when the survey responses are, are made by different individuals and may, they need to make some kind of uh, subjective judgments about the condition, then of course, uh, they are not necessarily directly comparable. So it might be that uh, that one apartment uh, classified as good might be in, in worse condition than another apartment that is just satisfactory, for example. So now that the source of errors is, of course, some, some uh, typing errors in the data. So even though nowadays there's increasing amount of uh, machine read, uh, let's say, scanner data, for example, uh, there are still, of course, uh, possibility that, uh, that uh, uh, or, or many, many data sources are, are typed by, by some, some, uh, some person. And there might be some, uh, some uh, for example, too many uh, zeros in the, in, the, in the variable if it's big numbers or the, or the decimal point is in the wrong place. And uh, so, so this kind of human error still, still can occur uh, today. And of course, uh, there might be also coding errors that somebody anyway, anyway writes the, the codes for, the, for, for data processing. But perhaps the most fundamental type, even if we would be, would be able to deal with this kind of uh, uh, human errors in data processing better and better, then uh, recall that, uh, that uh, econometrics is, uh, uh, has the role to uh, sort of breaching the gap between uh, abstract economic theory and, uh, and uh, empirical studies. So very often in, uh, in uh, economic theory, there are abstract uh, concepts such as uh, inflation or, or uh, interest rate. Uh, but, but in the real world, then, then inflation, we need to measure by some kind of price indices. And there might be several different price indices. And it's not always clear which price index is most appropriate for, the, for measuring the inflation in certain application. Uh, I mentioned the interest rate. So also, of course, uh, it's not always clear what is the risk-free interest rate in the market. Uh, very often in practice, then researchers use some uh, uh, government bond rate, but of course the government bonds are not entirely risk-free either. So, uh, so there is no such thing as, uh, as uh, interest rate in the, in the real world market. We need to use some kind of imperfect proxy. And if you think about more micro application, then, then, um, if you think about the earnings equation or, or in, in the labor economics, um, typically, of course, inherent ability of a person would be a very important uh, factor for the, to explain the earnings, but it's very difficult to measure what is the ability of an individual. So some researchers have used the IQ test scores as a proxy for the, for the ability, but uh, of course we know that uh, IQ tests have their own uh, sources of error. So, so they are far from perfect. Uh, and uh, these couple of examples just illustrate that, uh, that uh, in many, many types of applications, the, the empirical data 
and the measures that we have uh, may not be in entirely perfect measures of what we actually wanted to measure. So we need to resort to some kind of proxy variables uh, that, uh, that, uh, that may be better than nothing, but, uh, but are far from perfect. And this also, of course, nicely links to this uh, omitted variable case that, uh, that in many cases is using some kind of imperfect variable may be much better than omitting the variable completely. Like if you, if you have this example of uh, using I, IQ test score for ability, uh, it may be better than completely ignoring ability because if we, if we omit ability, then, then, then uh, we might have omitted variable bias in other explanatory variables. So this is, uh, this is then uh, one, one way to deal with the omitted variable bias is to then use some kind of uh, whatever imperfect proxy variables that we, we can have available. So therefore it's of interest to then see that, okay, does the situation get better if we have some, some, uh, some uh, uh, imperfect uh, proxies? So let's first consider, oh, sorry, first we need to, to, to understand that formally we need to have some kind of uh, formal model of measurement errors. And um, uh, in, in econometrics, uh, we usually think about the measurement error with uh, some kind of random variable which here I have indicated by, by, by variable v. So I assume that, uh, that v has zero mean and a constant variance. Uh, so the interpretation of this v is very similar to this epsilon that we have included in our regression models. So essentially, you can think about this v as, a, as a very similar to the, to the epsilon. It is just, uh, just some measurement error that uh, that uh, is perturbing our, our, our dependent variable y or our explanatory variable x. And let's start with the situation that this, uh, this measurement error is uh, contained in our unobserved uh, uh, dependent variable y. So suppose that we cannot measure this, this y directly, but we have some imperfect proxy q, uh, which is defined as, as y plus v. Okay, so like I mentioned as an example, suppose that y is the inflation, uh, but, uh, but we cannot observe it directly. So we replace inflation by, by some uh, price index, which is denoted by Q. And we think about this uh, price index as the true inflation plus some kind of measurement error inherent in the, in the, in the price index. So suppose then that our, our correct uh, regression equation is, is uh, stated as y plus uh, beta 1 plus beta 2x plus epsilon. So this could be this kind of uh, um, equation that governs the, the true inflation, but, but uh, we use then this kind of empirical uh, price index based on some kind of uh, price survey by, by uh, uh, statistics agencies such as Statistics Finland. So then notice what happens if we then replace this our dependent variable y by the by the proxy variable q. And here notice that uh, that we can then uh, rewrite this equation. So we define q as uh, y plus v, but similarly we can then write that uh, that y is equal to q minus v, and therefore we can then replace in the regression equation this y by, by q minus v. And then reorganizing, uh, this gives them uh, this uh, regression equation in terms of the proxy variable, which is the on the bottom row of the slide. So we can write q as equal to beta 1 plus beta 2x, plus uh, what I would call a composite error term uh, that I have highlighted in, in red color. So notice that in this case, the composite error term consists of this uh, original epsilon uh, of this, uh, of this uh, theoretical regression equation, plus then we have this measurement error v. So, so uh, it's quite natural that, of course, this measurement error in our dependent variable will be attributed to the, to the error term. And if you recall the introductory lectures, I already highlighted that this measurement errors in our our dependent variable is one, one motivation of, uh, of uh, introducing this epsilon in the first place. So 
any measurement error in our dependent variable will be attributed to the to this composite error term and uh, it just adds to the to the other sources of uh, of errors such as omitted variables and uh, and so on and so on so there is nothing nothing really inherently dramatic uh, if we if we use uh, uh, if we replace our uh, dependent variable y with some imperfect proxy so so this kind of potential measurement error in our dependent variable will be just uh, adding to the to the error term of the of the regression equation but uh, from the outset there's no reason to suspect that why would the measurement error in uh, in uh, y have anything to do with the with the x variables so it seems natural to assume that this x and v are are uncorrelated so therefore this is this is not really any any source of endogeneity if there is measurement error in y but the situation becomes very different uh, if we have measurement errors in the x variable and i will show it to you next so now i i little bit changed the notation compared to the previous example however i continue to denote the measurement error by v but uh, but uh, but let's denote the, the true, true explanatory variable by capital S. And now I denote the, the imperfect proxy as X. And uh, again, this X is equal to S plus V. So our explanatory variable is equal to S. And you can think of this S as, for example, some, some true signal plus there's some noise V. So essentially, this our explanatory variable is just signal plus noise. Okay, so how do we model then this, uh, this uh, measurement error in our explanatory variable? So uh, again, I will consider just a single regression model, but now suppose that we observe directly this uh, true y, and, uh, and uh, this y is a function of uh, constant b1, and plus there's a b, sorry, constant beta1, plus beta2 times uh, the signal s, plus uh, epsilon but um, now we have used instead of this uh, uh, this true capital s we have imperfect uh, uh, proxy x which is perturbed by noise v and uh, we can also then rewrite this equation as s equals x i minus v i so so in some sense this uh, true signal is uh, this uh, proxy x and if we, if we subtract from this proxy this noise v, then we have the true signal. So therefore, we can then substitute this uh, x minus v in the place of this uh, capital S. And on the bottom row of, the, of, the, of this slide, we have done that. So we can see that then in this case, this y is equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 times x plus a composite error term indicated with red color. And this composite error term in this case is then epsilon minus uh, beta 2 times v. Okay, so notice that whatever, wherever this, uh, this measurement error is, it, in the end it ends up to, the, to this uh, composite error term. But here the dramatic difference compared to the first example where the error was in, in the y variable, now that when the measurement error is in the x variable, then also this coefficient beta 2 is included in this uh, in the in the composite error term and this is the source of the endogeneity problem here okay so let's then uh, utilize some of the analytical results that we have we have uh, used before so remember that the OLS estimator for slope uh, beta 2 in the single regression case is simply calculated as the the ratio of the sample covariance of x and y and sample variance of x. Okay. And now using that formula, we can then, then see that, uh, that when we have this uh, imperfect proxy and we have this true regression equation uh, dependent on, the, on S, then uh, in fact this formula becomes to the form that, uh, that we need to take the ratio of sample covariance of uh, S plus V and y and then divided by the sample variance of uh, s plus v and now if we then take the expected value of this uh, uh, of this b2 
Uh, I don't have show it now here formally, but you can use same kind of reasoning as we have used before in many, many examples. So it can be shown that the expected value of this B2 is equal to true beta 2 minus beta 2 times variance of uh, this uh, uh, measurement error V divided by variance of uh, S plus variance of V. Okay, so here we see directly that there is now, now some systematic bias. If we would move this, uh, this uh, beta 2 on the left hand side, so, so the bias is simply expected value of B2 minus beta 2. So here, here is a couple of, couple of lessons about this, uh, this measurement error. So notice that, of course, the variance uh, operator cannot be negative. So the direction of bias depends on the sign of uh, coefficient beta 2. And uh, whatever, the, whatever the sign, in fact, the OLS estimator, when there are measurement errors in our explanatory variable x, will be biased towards zero. So if, if beta 2 is positive, then we have downward bias. If beta 2 is negative, then we have upward bias. And this is then, then important to, to know. In some sense, uh, uh, this is where this kind of terms uh, regression dilution or attenuation bias uh, refer to. So here is an uh, illustrative diagram I took from Wikipedia. So if you're interested in reading further about the errors in variables models, uh, then here is also a link to the, to the Wikipedia article. So in this diagram, suppose that this more steeper red line is the, is the true regression line. So if we have er measurement errors, then, then the slope of the, of the regression line will be biased towards zero. So then, then the slope will be smaller when the true beta 2 is, is positive. So this is why, why with the case of the measurement errors, then, then uh, the slopes will be biased towards zero. So um, I want to still write another interpretation how it might be still a little bit difficult to see that, okay, why it is the case that, uh, that when the measurement error was in, in, in Y variable, everything was fine. But uh, when it is in the X variable, we have an endogeneity problem. So think about it as follows. So I have here taken this uh, same regression equation where, which, which, we, which we developed earlier. So remember that when we, when we replace this, um, this uh, true S variable with X variable, then this uh, impact of measurement error was, uh, went to the, to the composite error term. So we have this epsilon minus uh, beta 2 times V as our composite error term. So this is, of course, just, uh, just errors epsilon and, and V both are random variables. So there's nothing wrong that there is this uh, random V uh, attributed to the error term. So it may be helpful to, to understand where this endogeneity come from is to then uh, rewrite this, our proxy variable X as sum of uh, S plus V. So this is how we defined X. So X is equal to S plus V. And uh, notice that this V is also going to the, to the, to the error term. So perhaps this equation then helps to clarify why the measurement errors in X variable are, are causing uh, endogeneity problem. Because now in this slide, I have highlighted this, uh, this measurement error V. So this measurement error V is also present in this X variable even though, though it was earlier, it was not written explicitly, but remember that X is just S plus V. So this V is also present in X and this V is also present in the error term. So clearly this assumption that, uh, that X and Epsilon should be uncorrelated is violated. So clearly this error term correlates with our exponentiary variable. And I hope that this, uh, this formulation makes it more clear where I have highlighted that there is this uh, measurement error V is present both in our explanatory variable and in our error term. And this is why there is this endogeneity problem when, when we have measurement errors, particularly in the explanatory variable. So I want to summarize that, uh, that of course, the uh, original purpose of uh, using this error term epsilon 
in the regression model is that the, we have potentially some measurement errors. Uh, but I want to clarify that these measurement errors uh, should be then in the dependent variable y. <clears throat> so as soon as there are some, some uh, measurement errors in our exploratory variables, then uh, this can cause some, some endogeneity problems. So this will be then, then making our OLS estimator biased towards zero, and uh, the estimator would be then, then inconsistent. And um, let me still mention this example that we had this, uh, this proxy variable for, for the ability. So suppose that uh, we have a situation that we want to estimate, for example, the impact of uh, education on earnings. Okay, so we, we, we have, for example, some years of schooling and we want to measure the impact of education on earnings. This is the usual type of earnings equation in, in labor economics. But if we don't measure the, the um, uh, ability of the person, so there might be, for example, some kind of uh, correlation with the ability and, uh, and uh, education. So, so maybe, maybe more clever people and want to go to, to have higher education. And if we then omit this kind of ability from the earnings equation, then we might have some omitted variable bias in our, our earnings and particularly impact of schooling on, on earnings might be biased if we, if we ignore the uh, ability. So then we might, uh, might resort to some kind of proxy variable for ability, for example, the, the IQ test score, but then, then there is measurement error in this IQ test score, so we still have endogeneity. But, uh, but if it is actually the uh, impact of schooling that is we are mostly, mostly interested in, so perhaps then it's better to include this kind of uh, imperfect proxy variable rather than have the omitted variable bias. So, so there might be some kind of trade-off that, uh, that um, whether we use some kind of proxy variable, which is still subject to the measurement errors, or we, or we have some kind of omitted variable bias. And um, I would think that even, even a poor proxy variable should be better than nothing because anyway, there's some, some uh, information in this kind of proxy variable such as uh, IQ test score. So it should be, it would be good to utilize it, but, um, but uh, then we should be also aware of this kind of uh, uh, measurement errors. So we come back to this kind of uh, discussion later in the next theme when we talk about the instrumental variables. But um, first, I will still cover this third type of uh, third type of endogeneity, commonly known as the simultaneity bias. Thanks for your attention, and uh, we'll continue in the next lesson.